Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2008 Portman Lecture in the Spirit of Entrepreneurship. My name is Andrew Samwick, and I'm the director of the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center here at Dartmouth. This afternoon, in collaboration with the Tuck Center for Private Equity and Entrepreneurship and the Dartmouth Entrepreneurial Network, we present Entrepreneurship in the Digital Age by Richard Parsons, the current chairman and former CEO of Time Warner. Before introducing today's speaker, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the Portman family, whose generous gift makes it possible for us to host this lecture. The gift was made by Mr. William C. Portman, a member of both the Dartmouth class of 1945 and the Tuck School class of 1947, and his three children, Rob, Dartmouth class of 1978, Wim, Tuck School class of 1981, and their sister, Virginia Portman Amos. The Portman family's relationship with Dartmouth began over 90 years ago when Arthur Portman, Bill's father, arrived in Hanover as part of the class of 1915 at the Amos Tuck School of Business. The purpose of the Portman Fund is to foster an understanding and appreciation of small business development, entrepreneurial activity and risk taking, and the role that public policy takes in shaping its course. In addition to the Portman Lecture in the Spirit of Entrepreneurship that has become a mainstay of our spring programming, the Portman Fund helps to support a number of initiatives on campus over the whole year, including the Founders Forum, Greener Ventures, and our Women in Business program. The internet revolution that began in the mid-1990s ushered in a tumultuous period in national and global economic development. Tumultuous here does not necessarily mean bad. All technological advances but particularly technology that goes directly to the ability to connect people together to exchange and improve ideas serves to lower the barriers to entry in all sorts of activities. The value of existing physical, human, and organizational capital changes. Some capital is relegated to the old economy, some is extolled as being part of the new economy, and some is not easily classified as one or the other. New opportunities are created to produce the same goods and services more efficiently, or to produce entirely new products. Technological progress fosters all manner of opportunities for those who have access to it. But even low barriers to entry are still barriers for some. The advent of new technology also has the potential to radically widen the disparities in economic, social, and political outcomes between those who have access to it and those who do not. In the case of the internet and related technologies, this is the digital divide, and it is so wide today that it is causing us to re-examine our notions of what becomes a basic right of national or global citizenship. Against this backdrop of societal developments, we are very fortunate today to be visited by Mr. Richard Parsons. From May 2002 to December 2007, Mr. Parsons served as Time Warner's Chief Executive Officer. He became Chairman of the Board in May 2003 and retains that position currently. Time Warner has been an industry leader in the fields of filmed entertainment, interactive services, television networks, cable systems, and publishing. In its January 2005 report on America's Best CEOs, Institutional Investor Magazine named Mr. Parsons the top CEO in the entertainment industry. As CEO, Mr. Parsons put in place the industry's most experienced and successful management team, strengthened the company's balance sheet, and simplified its corporate structure, and carried out a disciplined approach to realigning the company's portfolio of assets to improve returns. Mr. Parsons' tenure with Time Warner extends back to 1991 when he joined the company's board of directors and 1995 when he became the company's president. His responsibilities included all corporate staff functions, whether in finance, legal affairs, or public affairs and administration. There is literally no one who has seen and experienced the wonder and challenges of the internet revolution and the digital age from a better vantage point than Mr. Parsons. He has been at the interface of the old and new economy for over 15 years, and we are delighted that he brings the experiences and insights that he has gained to campus today. We are particularly excited to welcome him to the Rockefeller Center in 2008 as we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the center and the centennial of Nelson Rockefeller's birth. After completing his undergraduate education at the University of Hawaii and earning his law degree from the Albany Law School, Mr. Parsons held various positions in state and federal government, including as counsel for Governor Rockefeller and as a senior White House aide under President, General, President Gerald Ford. 
Nelson Rockefeller had a reputation for hiring and mentoring the brightest young people he could find. I think Governor Rockefeller would be proud of his protege, not just for his success in the boardroom, but for his civic engagement. Mr. Parsons has served as co-chairman of the Mayor's Commission on Economic Op Opportunity in New York, Chairman Emeritus of the Partnership for New York City, and Chairman of the Apollo Theater Foundation. He has served on the boards of Howard University, the Museum of Modern Art, and the American Museum of Natural History. It is a great honor for us to have Mr. Parsons with us today. His presentation will be followed by a brief period for questions and answers. During the Q&A, we will have helpers in the audience who have microphones. Please wait for one of them to arrive with a microphone before asking your question. Please also take this opportunity to turn off your cell phones. Without further delay, please join me in welcoming the 2008 Portman Lecturer in the Spirit of Entrepreneurship, Mr. Richard Parsons. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate that uh, over-generous introduction, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. When I was asked to do this, uh, I was told that it was going to be not so much a speech, um, but an informal discussion with a group of interested students. So what I've done is I've made some notes, um, and I will share some reflections with you on the subject of entrepreneurship in the digital age. And then, uh, as we just heard, we'll move to Q&A, which I'll try and get to as quickly as I can, because my limited experience in these matters is that people are always more interested on, in, uh, in what's on their mind than in what's on my mind. So, uh, I think I can get through this about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. But I, I guess the place to start, as you just heard from, from Andrew, that uh, I worked for Nelson Rockefeller basically for the decade of the 70s. I worked for him when he was governor of the state of New York and when he was vice president. And then in his uh, years uh, prior to his death when he was back as a, as a private citizen. And um, it's always an honor and a privilege for me to be able to um, do anything that helps perpetuate the legacy and memory of a man who I thought was a giant uh, in American politics and in American life, um, and who was an exemplar for what a public servant should be, um, because he was all of that. Now, I'll take you back to, in starting this discussion about entrepreneurship in a digital age, to uh, 1970, because everything, in order to understand anything, everything has a context, right? Including that broad subject matter, of what, what does entrepreneurship look like in this digital age? And as, as a point of reference for the context, I will tell you about a speech, or not a speech, many speeches that Nelson used to give back when he was governor of New York. He would start almost every speech by saying or reciting the fact that we live in a world of fantastic and accelerating change. So much, he would repeat that so often, we, we call that a WOFAC. You know, bomb fog is actually a term that you hear nowadays, nobody knows its origin. It was from speeches I think Hoover gave or something, the Brotherhood of Man, Fatherhood of God. But we call Nelson's a WOFAC, because he would start every speech by saying we live in a world of fantastic and accelerating change. The fact of the matter is, he was right. Um, but if he were around today, he'd be more right today. The pace of change in the world accelerates over time. So that, you know, for, for, for my grandmother, right, to live in a time where they invented airplanes, for goodness sake, and telephones was, uh, was remarkable. Well, you know, we'll have four equivalents four generational equivalents of those in our lifetimes because the pace of change just accelerates over time. And one of the things that has been driving that acceleration uh, in the last 20 years has been this so-called digital technology. Um, and to give you some sense of how dramatic and rapid um, change is today, and it's only going to get faster, uh, I, I will recite my own history with sort of digital technologies and companies built on digital technologies. Uh, if I were to ask you uh, what company, what American company had the, the, the greatest return to shareholders in the decade of the 90s, that is to say the highest stock price appreciation over the course of the decade? Anybody know? 
It was AOL. AOL stock price grew more and more rapidly than any other company, 14,000 public companies in America, any other company during the decade of the 90s. Here we are eight years later, AOL is just a footnote whenever you read articles about you know, internet companies today. All right? And who replaced AOL as the hot shooter? By the way, when we did, as Time Warner, when we did the merger with AOL, Time Warner, a company that had been around for 75, 80 years, which had household name brands, I mean gold standard brands in their magazine group, Time Magazine, Fortune, People, Sports Illustrated, in their cinema group, Warner Brothers, uh, in uh, the cable business, and the music business, we had you know, the Warner Music Group, which was the number one record label in the country back in the 70s. I mean, we had just co company after company after company that were just household names in terms of who we represented and who we were. Time Warner had a, a market cap of about $100 billion back at the turn of the century, back in 2000. AOL had a market cap, which AOL, the company was around less than 15 years and had hit its growth stride less than 10 years ago, had a market cap of $200 billion at that time. Um, today, you almost couldn't give AOL away. Uh, they were replaced by Yahoo. Yahoo was going to be the next company that was going to sort of take over the world on the back of this digital technology. And that lasted for just about a couple of years. Yahoo pioneered in, in the uh, you know, free to web portal. Um, and then somebody came along and obsoleted them. They were called Google. And Google, you know, if you read the papers today, or certainly if you read the papers six, eight months ago, you would think that Google was about to take over the world. And then along come these things called social networks, MyFace, you know, Facebook, which just had a valuation of $15 billion put on it by Microsoft. Every third or fourth year, there's some new company that comes along and seems to shoot to the moon, and it's going to represent the future. Things are changing so rapidly uh, in this space that it's, it's hard to keep up. And the scary part is only going to accelerate because we do live in a world of fantastic and accelerating change. So what is all that? That's the context for the discussion of what does entrepreneurship look like uh, in the digital age? And of course, uh, digital technology is, um, is changing the way we live to some extent and the way we conduct business, but it's not changing everything. For example, it's not changing the nature of the beast. People are still people. So a lot about entrepreneurship in the digital age is the same as prior to the digital age, in the pre-digital age. Um, and those are aspects of character. Um, so let's talk first about what's not changed or what's not different, and then we'll get to what's different. What's not different is that, A, all of us are not entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are a, if not special, I would resist that characterization, but a unique brand of person. Um, since I always like to argue by analogy, think about the difference between uh, explorers and settlers, you know, in the old days. Explorers were the ones who went out into the wilderness and to see what was there and to find, you know, new things and try new ways of life. And then once they went out and kind of established a beachhead, then the settlers followed. They, then, then the lawyers and the doctors and the accountants and the dentists and the school teachers and the moms and the pops all followed and fo sort of formed settlements. But the explorers were the risk takers. And that's the way I think about entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, first and foremost, they're risk takers. They're people who are comfortable taking risk. Um, but risk in a business sense. Well, what else distinguishes a, an entrepreneur from the rest of us? Um, I, will, I will give it to you from the perspective of an investor. What do investors look for when they see someone who purports to be entrepreneurial other than someone who's prepared to take risk? Well, they look for the normal things that we look for in any kind of human interaction, you know, intelligence and integrity, but they look beyond that. I'd say first and foremost, they look for passion. Most entrepreneurs are true believers. They believe passionately in whatever it is that they're about to undertake. And that's why they're prepared to take the risk, by the way, because their belief is so strong, they sort of look past the risk. And they sort of have such fervent belief, belief in what they're trying to do 
that that drives them to sort of disregard the risk and go out into the wilderness anyway. Uh, secondly, and this is, this is a part that particularly for those of you who are uh, on the younger end of the age, age curve and think that you may want to be an entrepreneur one day, investors look for a balance between idealism on the one part but pragmatism on the other. Most entrepreneurs really do believe almost in an idealistic sense that you know, they're going to change the world. I'm going to do something that's going to change the world. It's going to make the world a different and better place. But that idealism has to be tempered for a successful entrepreneur with pragmatism. Um, I was talking to some students earlier today and one of them asked me, well, I got this great idea and can I bring it to funders and investors to fund, you know, to build out of my idea? Can't do that in today's world. You have to show investors that you've taken a concept about which you believe passionately and which you think has an ideal driving it, but you've surrounded it with business discipline that you have developed more than an idea, you've developed a product maybe, that you've developed a business plan that shows how this idea is going to be productive of revenue and ultimately productive of profits. That there is enough, that you have enough of a, at least one foot on the ground that you're just not another idealist who is, you know, sort of dreaming great dreams, but who has the practicality to make those dreams come true. Uh, the third thing investors look for is, I'll put it this way, you know, somebody once told me that the beginning of wisdom is knowing what you don't know. Uh, all of us don't know something. Most of us don't know a lot. The wise ones among us have a sense of what we don't know and therefore have a sense of who we need to bring along on a journey with us who, who, who fills in our flat spots, who has knowledge, expertise, skills that we're going to need to become successful because in the complicated world almost nobody has the whole package. So when we look at, and we do a fair amount of investing in entrepreneurs in this digital age, when we look at, at uh, someone who's coming to us with an investment proposition, we not only sort of evaluate the qualities of the individual in terms of their character, their idealism, their pragmatism, but do they have people in their professional world who can help them navigate all of the various roads they're going to have to navigate. Now that sometimes shows up in the team they put together, sometimes it shows up in advisory boards that they put around them or full boards that they put around them. But is this a person who knows that he or she is not the whole show, that he or she is going to need other talented people who have other skill sets and other knowledge to help them launch and implement a business? That's a key thing that investors look at. And then the last thing I would say in terms of the human qualities, um, and this is almost more important from the point of view of the entrepreneur himself or herself than even an investor. Uh, you know, are, are you, each of you who thinks maybe one day I'll be an entrepreneur, are you a half full or half empty person? You know, the glass is half full or the glass is half empty? Because the one thing that's certain for everyone who sort of starts down the road towards launching a new business or a new enterprise is they're going to encounter some fair modicum of failure. Things never work out the way you drafted it up um, in your initial business plan or the way you thought it up in your initial thinking about business. And if you're, if you're not a person who has resilience and optimism and who can see the glass as half full all the time, you shouldn't start down that road because at some point in time, the disappointments and the failure will just become overwhelming. Uh, but for those who have optimism and ebullience and who basically look at life like, you know, it didn't happen this time, but I'm going to get it the next time and I'm going to keep putting one foot in front of the other and persist. Um, that's an important quality for most successful entrepreneurs. And I'll come back to that in a minute when I talk about a specific example because that always helps illustrate things. So those things, whether you were an entrepreneur 50 years ago, today, or 50 years from now, I think those, those human characteristics and qualities are going to remain a constant. 
That said, the landscape is still much changed for entrepreneurship in this digital age. And so now I want to talk a little bit about in what ways has it shifted. Let me start with, with an old business axiom, which is that you, knew, you need two things to launch and sustain a successful business. You need management and you need capital. Management's all the stuff we were just talking about, you know, the ability to conceive of a vision, to be practical about how you approach that vision, to put people around you who can help you manage your way through to the vision, to have the persistence and perseverance to stay on track. That's all in the realm of management. Capital, on the other hand, is the money, the resources you need to launch and sustain a business. It costs money to start almost anything, and particularly to start a new business. The difference between the digital age, however, and the pre-digital age, let's call it post-industrial but pre-digital age, is that in the pre-digital age, it cost a heck of a lot of money. Capital was usually the principal barrier to entry for people who had great ideas. I have a great idea, you know, I think I've, I've figured out a, a, a better way to build a mousetrap or a better way, you know, to have an in, internal combustion engine or whatever it is I figured out. But now I need the resources to put my ideas to the test. And, you know, finding those resources and finding someone who would back you was a much, much more formidable process in the pre-digital age than it is today. And there are a couple of reasons for that. The first is, and both of them relate to the onset of, of, of so-called digital technology, which I probably should have started here. You know, what's different about digital technology than, than previous technologies? It's really the ability to, to reduce anything that can be carried by voice, by video, or any form of data to sort of electronic impulses that can be sent and then reassembled at the speed of light anywhere in the world instantaneously, right? So that, that you know, in the old days where, where you, I, I, as you heard, I went to undergraduate school in Hawaii, and I remember distinctly uh, back in the days, this was in the 60s, they had tape delay for the football games and big, you know, the you know, race that was just run on Saturday, the Kentucky Derby. So you would have to lock yourself in your dorm room and have no contact with any living person for 24 hours if you wanted to sort of see an event that was broadcast live here in the United States, you know, in real time in Hawaii, because otherwise somebody would tell you who won the Derby or something like that, they'd all be ruined. And that was because we didn't have the technology that could move video around the world. It went by antennas, right? Um, and the same was true for voice and the same was true for data. And so we've had you know, years and years of putting in very expensive infrastructure to move these things around. And then along comes digital technology where, where, where images, where voices, where sounds, where text can all be reduced to electronic impulses packaged and sent anywhere in the world like that. So that technology has had two profound effects on the availability of capital to entrepreneurs. The first is it gave rise to what I'll call the, the venture capital industry. Um, as people began to understand that there was a whole new wave of technology coming along that, that would enable clever entrepreneurs to create new business forms and new business models um, from scratch, a group of investors said, you know what we need to do? We have, we have to start making capital more available at the very early end of these business enterprises, creating these business enterprises, so that we can nurture them and grow them into full-fledged businesses. So you don't have to deal with a bank anymore or a classic traditional source of capital. You had a whole new group of people, uh, one of whom was Lawrence Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller's brother, who founded something called Venrock, which was one of the first venture capital firms um, focused on nascent businesses built around, built, building around new technology. And so that was the source of funding for companies that are household names today. Intel, which was one, 
Uh, Apple was one of their early uh, investments. So that industry, which got its start in the 70s, is now in full flight. It's a mature industry. There is, you know, there are established venture firms around that look to put capital in ideas at early stages, whereas that was not the case prior to, to these venture capitalists coming along. But the second phenomenon, and one that is, I think, even more powerful, is that the technology itself has obviated the need for a lot of capital. And by that I mean, uh, I'll give you some historic examples, and I'll give you one that, that's very current and that really makes the point. Um, for a good while after our merger with AOL, Steve Case and I would sort of, were, we, you know, were partners. He was the chairman, I was the CEO. And he would talk about the difference between how he built AOL and how Time Warner built all of its other, I'll call them analog businesses. You know, the rule, for example, in the magazine business, it's always been it takes a magazine about five years to get to profitability because you have a lot of upfront expense. You have to have writers, uh, the printing and manufacturing process for the magazines themselves is expensive. You have to get distribution in. You have to build a subscribership over time and get some advertisers. And if you're breaking even or turning into the black after five years, you're about on the industry average for a successful magazine because it costs so much to get started. Well, the way AOL got started was they rode over the existing telephone lines, right? They didn't have to spend a penny to put in the infrastructure that they needed to build their business. Um, now, they did have to buy servers and routers and things like that, so there was some capital involved. But the big money, the big money had already been spent over the last 70 or 80 years by the phone companies who spent billions of dollars putting in a network of wires and fiber optics throughout the United States on which this new digitally augmented business could ride. So that it didn't cost Steve billions of dollars to get into business with AOL. In fact, it cost him tens of millions, but that's a way big difference from billions. Um, and nowadays, it's even simpler, because nowadays that the internet has really sort of grown out and is robust and has what they call open source infrastructure. I'm, I won't, software, I won't get into too much detail. But basically, you don't have to even have servers and routers and other forms of infrastructure. You can sit at your computer, and if you have software development skills, you can essentially use someone else's infrastructure to create a business. So to put that in context, let me give you a real world example. And it's the example, it's called Bebo. I talked about it to a group of students earlier today. Bebo is a social networking site. It's a place you can go on the internet where you can engage with other people. Uh, you can share information, you can share music and photographs and something about your life and just network in a social way. <clears throat> it was created by a guy who was a 1991 graduate of something called Imperial College in London. Uh, he was a physicist, but just undergraduate level. Got out of school in 91, his name is Michael Bryce. Uh, and went to work for an insurance company. Worked for an insurance company for about seven or eight years in their IT department and decided that he not only liked working with computers, but that he was good at it and that he wanted to be his own boss. So he quit. And in the classic fashion, as I was suggesting before, he launched a couple of businesses out of his kitchen, <coughs> which failed. So from 1999, when he started on his own to about 2001, he launched a couple of businesses. They went nowhere, failed. He actually ended up moving in with his in-laws. Um, in, two, in 2001, he launched another business, uh, which was one of these sort of e-card businesses, which actually succeeded. That was his first success, <coughs> excuse me, which he sold for a small amount of money so that he could move out from under his, uh, 
his in-laws. And then in 93, in 03, he had his first sort of real big success. He won something called Ringo.com, which was a music site, which he ended up selling to somebody for like a million and a half bucks. So now he was on his way. In 2005, okay, three years ago, he launched this Bebo, this social networking site, by essentially, he was the only programmer. His wife was the rest of his staff. His wife did everything else. He programmed it. She managed the, the, you know, the revenue part of it, trying to sell ads, trying to get content for it. And he didn't have to put up any real money because he was able to ride his service, his programming, on the existing infrastructure of the internet. So it was just a question of, you know, did people like the site? Would people come to the site? Could he build an audience? He listened to his, you know, he had a group of friends who started using it, listened, made modifications, improved the site, got more content, got more people to come and bring their content to the site. This is starting in 2005. In March of this year, less than three months after he launched Bebo, he sold it to us for $850 million. We're about to, we'll close that deal in about a week, and he'll get $850 million, and we'll get this Bebo site that this guy created um, out of his head using the advice and expertise and talent of a lot of his friends. And he's got, and he, he did his first capital raising. He raised his first capital for the business in 2006, a year after he launched it, because he knew he had something going, he had to hire some people, so he raised $15 million from a venture capital fund. He's got about 100 employees, and he just, sold, he just did a deal at $850 million. That's $8.5 million per employee. It's ridiculous. I mean, you would never have heard of something like that 15 or even 10 years ago. But today, you know, this Mark Zuckerberg, who has Facebook, created it as a, as a, as a, a network for college kids to stay in touch with their college peers. I'm sure most of you hear Facebook pages and whatnot. He just got a valuation on his company by Microsoft. They didn't buy it, but they bought a small piece of it that values the company at $15 billion. The guy's 23 years old. Um, and he put what he could come up with and what his father would lend him into the business. I mean, there was no real capital required to get into that business. And that's going to be more the model in the digital age because what digital technology enables you to do is to create these applications that ride on pre-existing infrastructure, infrastructure that somebody else has paid for and is now open to you. And so it really is going to be an age of remarkable, <coughs> excuse me, opportunities for men and women. I won't say young men and women because I know, uh, you know we've got uh, a friend of mine who was a housewife who uh, created a site for mothers because she hadn't been able to find you know, information that she needed that a friend of mine just bought for him $25 million. Um, People who have fluency in this technology, <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm recovering from what Andrew told me was a sissy virus that we get down in New York because you get robust viruses up here. Um, but sissy or not, you know, it's taken me a while to get over this thing. Um, people who have, who have vision and, and sort of a concept and who are prepared to take a risk and who are prepared to, to, and mostly now it's the risk of your own time and talent and treasure. But the doors are wide open for entrepreneurs and the barriers to becoming one, the requirements that used to apply and that still do apply in the non-digital world of having the capital to fund your business enterprise are being alleviated at an incredible rate. So, I think it's a very exciting time for people who have the entrepreneurial instinct and who have skills in this digital arena. And uh, with that, I think I'll stop and take questions.
Yes, sir. Wait a minute. You have to. You have to. The life cycle of products, life cycle of businesses, becoming shorter and shorter, easier to get in. But you bought people. But isn't it true that somebody can come down the road next week and invent something that would make people outdated and your company's invested in fortune? businesses in this age, just like you can get them up like that, they can also be obsoleted like that. Um, that's a fair observation. And we've actually been to that movie. We were in that movie. Now, when AOL was created, it was created on the back of making emailing accessible to everybody, right? It was no longer just a tool for professors or for the Defense Department guys. Anybody, your grandmother could email, you know, her grandkids at school and send, and AOL made it easy and fun. And so their business model was to charge for that. What happened to AOL was it became so simple to manage that along came the Yahoos of the world and said, we'll give it to you for free. And so AOL's entire business model, that's why AOL has now been reduced to being just a footnote. Uh, in the stories is because they've been obsoleted by the next generation, by Internet 2.0. And <clears throat> the reality about these social networks, we, you know, we looked at MySpace, uh, which Rupert Murdoch bought for $560 million, I think, a couple, three years ago. And we concluded not to play because, you know, who's to say, you know, there was something called Friendster before MySpace. MySpace came along and knocked them out of the box. Who knows when the next one is going to come along? <coughs> Excuse me. But um, Murdoch bought it, took the gamble, and is going to make a fortune with it. I mean, he's been trying to sell it for $10 billion, having spent $560 million, you know, about a half a million dollars, two and a half years ago. Nobody's going to give him that, but somebody gave him 4 or $5 billion for it today. Um, and the, the issue for companies like ours is that if you're going to be in this space, you got to play. You can't, you can't value companies by traditional means anymore. And you have to take the chance that you ha if you have a first mover advantage that you can hold it. But you take the risk that something comes along, like Yahoo and the free portals came along and they, absolute, abs they obsolete your old business. So it's, it's a different, different business dynamic now, different set of risks. But if you're going to be in the game of media and communications, you've got to play. It's, a, it's actually a very perceptive and good question. Um, first to the premise of it, which is that lots of young people want to go into these new digital um, enterprises. And it's because, you know, you know, who among the young nowadays, and particularly the, the young and the privileged going to top flight colleges and with the best educations, doesn't fundamentally want to work for themselves, right? They don't want to work for anybody else because they don't want to be, they don't want to be shackled by some chucklehead like me when they know everything. Um, and it's just a matter of, of, of them having an opportunity to sort of show the world they know everything. So they want to go into a place of employment where 
they are as free as they can be to sort of bring whatever level of talent they have and, and enthusiasm and idealism, uh, and then get rewarded for it also on the other end. So yeah, we're seeing a lot of that. And it, you know, it's good, but it has its limitations. One of the things that we saw, for example, when we tried to, to merge um, AOL, this is going back to 2000, 2001, with the old time Warner culture is uh, they, were, they were riding a hot hand and they were full of themselves. They had a lot of success. As I said, it was the fastest growing stock in the 90s. Um, a lot of wealth and a lot of, of enthusiasm about changing the world. But they really weren't business people. They really weren't business people. And you see that a lot in a lot of the new technology startups. They, they, their orientation is to let's build something that's cool. Let's build something that is fun. Let's build something that's going to change the world. But not necessarily let's build something that will generate a level of revenues that will offset the expense that we have incurred to build it and that will give us a bottom line. And so a lot of these companies I just mentioned, you know, the MySpaces, even the Bebos, they have no revenue model. They've built something that is cool and that people use, but that people don't pay them for. And therefore, you know, you can have, as Bebo does, you know, 80 million unique visitors or something like that and generate no revenue and therefore no income because they haven't figured out that part of the equation yet. And so the, the challenge that the overall business environment is going to have over the next, let's call it half a dozen years, is taking the let's build something that's cool and has the potential to change the way people live their lives cohort and blending them with the old cohort that says, okay, let's figure out how to make money. I don't want to sound too crass with this, but at the end of the day, you can't sustain the former model. At the end of the day, you can't sustain a model that is a free model because people will sort of say, well, it was cool, but now I got to go feed my family. And the people over here who were in this sort of old media world have the business acumen and understanding of how you build and, and, and create a sustainable business, but not the knowledge and the sort of almost organic understanding of the new technologies to do this piece. So blending those two cultures so that you have cool, useful stuff that changes the world for the better in a sustainable business model is the challenge going forward. And while it sounds, it's easy to say, that's not so easy to do because they're very different types of folk, very different. Right back there. Uh, my question, I guess, has to do with sort of revenue models in this industry and uh, new digital companies. I think it's interesting that AOL, which was one of the subscription models, now is actually in that sense. I think we're not wondering, do you think the revenue models for these digital companies, do you think there's a revenue model that's not all about advertising, online advertising? The answer is, well, I think everybody heard the question. The answer is probably, um, and I think it's probably going to end up being some mixture of the two that this new technology enables. Just to, to give context to the question, when AOL was launched, as I said, in order to get access to it and to have access to this sort of spiffy new communication device called the internet and all these chat rooms and whatnot, you had to pay a subscription fee. And so their, their revenue model was a subscription-based one. We put all this up, we create this world for you to come and live in and communicate in, and you pay us a monthly fee to do it. What happened to AOL was within 10 years, virtually everything that you could do inside the AOL cloud was replicated outside the AOL cloud for free. So that undercuts the subscription model. So what's replaced it is the advertising model, like think, uh, broadcast television. You know, you just, you buy a TV set, you hook up your antenna, you turn it on, you get ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, for free. How do they pay for that? They pay for that by having advertising 
ride along with what you see on the television, and the advertisers essentially pay the load. So that's the model that Google has, and that's the model that is now the kind of um, model of the day, if you will, or answer of the day on the internet. And the question is, is there going to be yet another revenue generating um, model that takes its place? I think it's going to end up being a blend of a little bit of subscription at a much lower price. You know, AOL got to 25, 26 bucks a month. But you can get the music services and other things that are unbundled for two ninety five, right, or three dollars. There's going to be some of that. It's going to be some advertising, and then it's going to be some pay per download, pay per service. Whether it's a pay per view, pay per listen, pay per opportunity to hear, it, it'll be a combination of of discrete um, pay per episode subscription and advertising my guess is that eventuates over the next half a dozen years. I, I we have, oh, excuse me. Sorry, I'm here. Sorry. There you are. Um, I was just wondering, you touched on the um, magazine business a little bit, and I was wondering how, in terms of the time of business, how are they Magazine business. Yeah, well, the, the challenge for us with Time Inc. was to convince them that they're no longer in the magazine business. Um, magazine business, by the way, it's, it's a great business. Uh, it's, it's stable. It's productive of a high degree of cash flow because the brands are, you don't have to keep marketing behind them. But it, its growth has been stunted, sort of like, Newspapers only not as bad. A big part of the revenue stream for magazines, that's a two revenue stream business. You get revenues from subscriptions and you get revenues from advertising. And a big part of the advertising base of magazines is being siphoned away by the internet. And some small part of the, of the subscription base, though not much, um, because as one of my colleagues who once called the internet a black hole used to like to say, said, that, you know, you have the three B's that protect the magazine business, the bedroom, the bathroom, and the beach. You know, people, people don't take their computers to those three locations, although today they do. Uh, but what we've said to our magazine colleagues is, look, stop thinking that you are in the ink on paper business. You are in the content creation and editorial business. You go, you have reporters and writers who go and investigate things and report on them and give a slant on them and have insights into them, whether it's sports, news, entertainment, lifestyle, information. And that can live in a magazine, in ink on paper, but it can also live on the internet in a different form of distribution. And so we've been, we, we now think of ourselves as in the publishing business, and we publish information um, in ink on paper form, in some magazines, and uh, on the web. So if you were to ask me, what's the, the biggest celebrity site? These are called verticals. On the web right now, it's people.com. Uh, because we took the People brand, which is, People magazine, by the way, is the most profitable magazine in the world by orders of magnitude. It's just unbelievable uh, how profitable that magazine is. Um, and it's because the content is, you don't, you know, like for Time Magazine, I have to have news bureaus all over the world and serious reporters and stuff like that for people. You just snap a bunch of pictures of a bunch of Hollywood people running around doing silly things and, and boom, you have a magazine that makes a lot of money. And so now we've taken that same content and we put it on the web and it draws, and it's free on the web, it draws, you know, millions of, of viewers, and then you sell advertising against that. Now, the, the, the difference between the print version and the web version is um, advertising is far more lucrative in the magazine space right now than impressions on the web. People just don't, they still don't know how to value that and, and how to pay for it. So an ad that runs 
in my magazine that, that may generate a dollar in revenue. That same ad on the web may generate five cents in revenue. So you have to get, you have to get that much more reach to have it be a one-for-one one trade off. But, you know, like everything else, it's evolving. And I think our magazine, our former magazine company, is going to be fine so long as they can make the transition to a digital world and not just have the printed version, but the online version that's formatted and presented in a way that people who access information online want it. You know, nobody wants to go online to read a magazine like you would read a magazine in the bathroom. They want to use it differently. They want to interact with it. They want to have feedback with it. They want to be able to take pieces and send them to their friends. So it has to have all of that, those bells and whistles. But so far, so good. I'm encouraged that our, that our publishing business is going to be a survivor in the digital age, whereas I think, like the newspaper, is going to have a tougher go. This question uh, pertains to the initial campaign. these two and when do you know to combine content distribution like Google is trying to do uh, and when do you know like that one has no bearing upon the other how do you make that decision there are a lot of questions in that one question so so I'll, I'll try and unpack them the first question was the original concept with AOL was you're going to have essentially Time Warner content flowing through the AOL distribution system, and that was going to sort of add value. And it didn't work. Um, it didn't work for a number of reasons. Number one, it turns out that, that particularly back then, and it, it, it seems like something that happened, this is 2008, something that happened seven years ago, right, 2001, wouldn't be back then, but to me it's an ancient history. I mean, we've gone through several generational turns. People didn't go on AOL and in those days, they didn't go on the web to get content. They still watched TV. They still went to the movies. They still bought magazines. They went on the web, and they used AOL for communication purposes, to email, to chat, to instant message, not to read People magazine. And so trying to feed them um, a, a steady diet of content on the web, it, we weren't getting any bang for the buck. Uh, and so, and even now, people still, you know, young people tend to go more to the web because we now have YouTube and you can have, you have, you have multimedia presentations on the web, which you didn't even seven years ago. So you can see full motion video and you can watch a movie and stuff like that. But even still, it's, it's pretty suboptimal. It's not the best way to watch a movie. It's not the best way to listen to music. You know, if you can download it, that's one thing, but streaming music is not the best way to listen. It's not the best way to access content. It's still primarily a communications medium. So the premise, to the extent that that was one of the premises that supported the merger, the premise was premature, is the way I'd put it. I mean, the, the gentleman asked me before about, about what, did we, what was the difference between the cultures and what did the old guys know that the new guys didn't, and vice versa. Um, all of my AOL colleagues believed, they were true believers, remember I mentioned that before, they honestly, truly believed that this technology was going to change the world in a couple of years. I remember the chief technology officer at AOL stood up at our first joint board meeting when we put the companies together, and he held up a, um, a CD one hand and a DVD in another. And he said to the board, he said, in two years, 18 months, two years max, these are going to be obsolete. And he sort of threw them over his shoulder and said, everything is going to come into your house via the web and through streaming and so on and so forth. Eventually, he's going to be right. He just wasn't right in 2001. And so they thought that there was going to be a lot more bang for the buck in terms of putting content on 
And that's not why people were using that medium. Now, when do you know that, that it's time to decouple content from distribution? Uh, in our case, we're not going to sell the cable company. We're just going to spin it off. We're going to separate Time Warner Cable from the rest of Time Warner. In the past, over the past 20 years, because we've had content and distribution together, we've been able to do some things that really have led the industry. I mean, almost everything that HBO, first of all, the creation of HBO was because we had, we had some content creation ability and we had this distribution mechanism that we controlled. So essentially you, you introduce it into the marketplace on your own bottom. Uh, video on demand, all that sort of stuff was done because our content guys and our distribution guys could work together. The reality is today, however, that, that the cable company, for most of its 50, 60 years of existence, cable has meant delivery of video signals into the home, video programming. Cable was an equivalent of television distribution, right? That's what cable was. In the last 10, 15 years, cable has become the equivalent of a phone company. Right now, I've got almost as many phone customers on my cable system as I have TV customers, and almost as many high-speed data customers, and the phone is catching up. So cable is looking more and more and more like Verizon, and Verizon is looking more and more like cable because they put fiber in so they could, they could always do voice and data. Now they can do video. We could always do voice, we could always do video. Now we can do voice and data. So there's going to be a shakeout down the road between the distribution companies and the cable companies are going to look more like phone companies and the, 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 the financial dynamics of that capital intensive utility like company are just totally different from the financial dynamics of a content company and that's the primary reason for, for separating them. Now which is a better business? I like them both. I really like, I like the cable business uh, because you know, so a human beings' appetite for ability to connect and communicate with each other seems insatiable. You come up with any new communication device you come up with, instantly people jump on it, and the next thing you know, we were talking earlier about cell phones. Somebody said when I started here, she was a senior. You know, if you had a cell phone, it was unusual. Now, if you don't have a cell phone, you're from another planet. You know, and no matter where you go, people are on their phones and they're communicating with each other. And the cable business is basically right in the middle of that trend and loop. And I like the content businesses because the, you know, these are, it, it's not commoditizable. Each creation is unique, right? Each movie is different from all the other movies. Each song is different from all the other songs. And if you can protect your creations in a digital world, you have something that lives for, if not ever, for many business cycles that is unique and, and, and not replicable. So I think both, both businesses, I, I know that both businesses will be around for the duration, and I think they'll both be good businesses to be investors in. Whoops. Okay. kind of emerging trends in media and technology. How much entrepreneurship goes on within the company? Uh, that's a really good question. And, and the seeds of the answer, at least the seeds of my answer, were in where I started off this, this talk by saying that, you know, first it was AOL as the hot shooter in the internet space, and then it was taken, its place was taken by Yahoo, and then Yahoo's place was taken by Google, and now Google's place is being sort of snuck up on by the, by the uh, social networking companies. And it's because, uh, you know, big companies have a hard time innovating and being entrepreneurial. Uh, what happens in, 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 a, in, a, in a big company is that people are, you know, people do, this is a rule of management, people do what they're paid to do. Most people can figure out how do I maximize my earnings in this environment. And so that's where I'm gonna put my time and, and attention. Um, and you know, the bigger a company gets, the more, and the more robust 
and powerful the revenue streams, the more the, the, the need to sort of control, have budgets, have targets, have business plans, and then to meet your plan, because that's how you get paid. That's how you get maximize your pay. You, you meet and then just barely exceed your business plan. So most capable business leaders sort of look at their business, make some projections going out, you know, sort of on a steady course. I can just take this, build on it a little, you know, squeeze the guys here, take out a little expense there. And then they build a plan and then they want to stay on that plan and that's how they that's how they perceive themselves to get paid and that's how they pay their people who work for them. So in comes a guy or a gal who says, I have a great idea. If we, you know, how about we go left over here instead of going right and it's only going to cost us so much and when they say, well, well, have you, have you pre-sold this to our advertisers? No. Um, do we have any subscribers? No, because we don't have a product yet. Well, let's not do that then because, you know, that could throw me off my plan. That happens and organizations become risk averse the larger they get. And they know what they know. And the last thing is most, most frequently new ideas are inimical to the existing business paradigm. So example, when we merged with AOL, Steve Case wanted to take all of the music that Warner Music Group produced and put it on AOL for free. Well, the music guys went Ballistic, you know, they had a five billion dollar revenue business, billion dollars in earnings, and this guy wanted to give it away. Now, Steve's theory was that if we had all that music for free on AOL, the subscribers would stay, and we'd get even more subscribers, and you'd make your money that way. Whereas for the music guys, he was hollowing out their business completely, so they resisted. You know, this was the Battle of Dunkirk. They, they, they were, you know, sort of laying down in. And the tide, you know, saying we're not, we're not, we're not going to be moved, B because nobody wants to jeopardize an existing successful business model. So these disruptive technologies are—it's like tissue rejection in a big organization. They just go like, Ugh. so that's why all the young people who are coming out of colleges, who think they, you know, have some swat in this digital world, don't want to work for big companies. They want to go with these little internet startups because. They're going to change the world. They're going to disrupt the existing uh, business, and they're going to be creative. And that's why it's so hard for the big companies. What, 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 what ends up happening is exactly what happened in our Bebo example. Now, if you think about it, AOL actually had was the first social networking company. They were called chat rooms. And literally, millions of people would occupy these chat rooms, and they do what what college kids now do on Facebook. They talk about each other, they share information about each other, blah, 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 blah. When we moved away from the subscription model, AOL was incapable of creating MySpace, Facebook, Bebo, as by the way, was Disney, was Fox, was, was Google, was Yahoo. So, what happens, the way the cycle works is young people come out, they create these things, and they get them to a point where, as I say, where it's cool to be cool, but now you've got to make some money. Then they sell them to the bigger companies who try not to kill them in the crib. I mean, that's, that's, that's the reality. Every company you go and talk to, by the way, will tell you, oh, no, no, we have a culture of innovation and risk-taking and blah, 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 but just look at the results. The results are all of these new technology enhanced companies are being created in somebody's garage and then being acquired after, their, after a business has been created. They're not being created inside the big companies. You mentioned disruptive technologies. Um, I'm wondering how a company like Time Warner basically works uh, with or against companies like Napster that might come out and promote piracy of Warner Music Group songs, or if there were to be a website that promoted, uh, I guess, piracy of Warner Brothers films right after they were released. Yeah. How do you guys react to something like that? We try and put them out of business. And in fact, we did put Napster out of business. Um, that's another a fault line on which the battles are being fought right now. 
I said earlier, the reason I like the content companies is because every, every product is to some extent unique. Uh, and the, the question is whether you can protect it in a digital world because dig digital technologies allows you to make perfect copies of anything that can be digitized, which is anything that in the entertainment space, and send it to a gazillion people with the push of a button. So for companies like ours, Time Warner was when we owned the music company, I know we were the largest copyright owner in the world. I still think we are, I still think we are. So for a company that is in, so heavily invested in copyright, you can't tolerate people stealing your stuff. That's the way I think about it. You know, not respecting the fact that somebody owns this intellectual property, just like, you know, you couldn't have somebody come in here and sort of unbolt half of these chairs and take them in the dark of night and just let them get away with it. Um, so what we try and do is first we try and hammer them, to be candid, and then we try and negotiate with them to sort of say there's got to be, you know, because in some respects, all the content companies want their content to get the widest possible distribution it can get. They just want to be paid for it on some rational basis. Uh, so, yeah, but, you know, the generation that sort of grew up with the internet has a, a kind of inbuilt notion that, hey, music should be free or content should be free. And so you gotta, as I say, there's a clash of wills right now. You have to first shake them out of that perspective and then negotiate a way that, that both sides can win where people can get what they want, where they want it and how they want it, and at a reasonable price and with the assurance of convenience. Um, and that's, but not let somebody just sort of take your stuff and run away with it. The music business has changed uh, radically in the last five years, especially since Apple got into the arena with iTunes and, and the iPod. Uh, what do you think is going to happen now in the next big battle, which seems to be the video and yeah, the yeah. movie business? Um, good question. The music business has changed radically. Um, I had pointed out to a group of students I met with earlier, we sold our music business just about five years ago because we saw this coming. And it's not that there won't be a music business going forward. I just don't know what it looks like. And I don't think anybody does. I think, you know, Steve Jobs has a vision. Maybe his vision comes true. I think the music companies are sort of challenging that now because they're not making enough out of his vision. He's making all the money. But it's changing and it's changed for good. It's not going to go back to the way it was. Now the question is whether that same paradigm or model applies in the video space. And I don't think so. I think for a, lot, a number of reasons. One is the quality of the product. You put on those little button speakers that you put in your ears with the iPod, you know, it's not like having, you know, uh, 40 amp Bose speakers in your living room, but it's pretty darn good. It's pretty darn good. So the quality of what you get on the music side is comparable to the quality of what you would get in a non-digital arena. And it's also portable, so that's an added advantage. On the video side, that's not the case. You know, looking at, looking at a, a, a movie on a two and a quarter by two and a quarter screen, um, it just isn't as satisfying as looking at a movie on a 51 inch plasma TV set in your living room. So that the, the, the quality of the delivery of the product is not as compelling. Secondly, the whole business model around movies and videos is different than music. One of the complaints we heard over and over again when we were still in the music business was from, you know, teenagers who were saying, you know, why should I have to buy a CD that had 12 songs on it when I only wanted one? You know, that's why, and that's why I go to Napster or you know, some of the other sites, because I just want this one and you guys are trying to rip me off by making me buy 11 songs I don't want just to get the one I do. So Steve solved that problem for him, digital technology solves that problem, because you can get exactly what you want, you can get the song you want. That's not the way 
video is marketed. You know, we don't sell movies 12 at a time. We have to buy, you know, 12 movies in order to get Iron Man, right? If you want to get Iron Man, you go to Iron see Iron Man. Um, and that's actually a very significant difference that, uh, that I'm not sure Steve and his, you know, Apple engineers have fully taken into consideration. So they got a couple of things different in the video side of the equation. One, an inferior product delivery mechanism. And two, they're fighting against a different business model. So I don't see, I don't see the world moving from going to the movies, as we know it today, or buying you know, these big flat screen plasmas. We sold more of those in the United States last year than in, in, in the history of you know, those, those sets, moving to a you know, two or three inch mobile screen. I just, that's not to say that digital, digital technology isn't going to have an effect. I don't see this being as disruptive as it is in the music space. We'll see. In the back. Just a quick question about valuation. Mm -hmm. uh, valuation in terms of what was done in the early 90s and how valuation is being applied now. If you give us a sense on what the issues were with the assumptions that were being made then and now, how they've changed and how you mitigate those risks today. Yeah. Um, must be a business school student. You know, the art of valuation is it's very hard for those who, who were raised in my era. And in fact, um, I will, I'll make a confession before this group that I made only to my board of directors. I'm not, I don't know that we would have done Bebo if I was still CEO of the company. I used to say that. that's why we didn't do MySpace, because I was CEO of the company. We do a lot of things. Because using traditional valuation methodologies, of looking at the revenues and looking at earnings, right, and applying some multiple to those based on a cash flow analysis, you can't do that in the internet world. Um, we, we looked at YouTube and how, in God's name, the Google guys got to $1.6 billion for YouTube, I have no idea. I have no idea because YouTube had, I think, $10 million in revenue. They had no earnings. $10 million in revenue. If I could get that multiple for Time Warner, I could sell Time Warner for $7 trillion. I'd be the second largest economy in the world next to the United States. But so, so valuation has moved in this digital space to what I call kind of a hope and a promise that, that if you get the eyeballs, which is what YouTube did have, which is what Bebo has, which is what Facebook has, they have tremendous user engagement that somehow, some way, and at some time you're going to be able to figure out how to monetize those in a way that will give you a return. And since, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not of your generation, um, I'm not even of the generation between you and me. You know, I, I, I couldn't figure it out, I couldn't get there, but that, that was a sure sign it was time for me to sort of step down, stand aside and bring somebody else in to sort of start chopping at this log. Because valuations now are based on entirely different metrics than they were in the 90s. They're based on, on user engagement and um, other projections as opposed to revenues and earnings. Because most of these companies have no earnings. Some of them have no revenues. But they have, they have people who are devoted to them and, and a growing belief on the part of traditional business that this is the way the world is moving and our job will be how to figure out how to, how to monetize that, that traffic. Pleasure. It's been fun.